Hello, my name is Patty, and the last name is Lang, and I'm the coordinator for this organization of Deaf Spotlight in Seattle, Washington, and I've been uh, directing this for five years, so I'm great that we're doing this again. I have some amazing panelists with me. Well, they're virtual, so we're having a teleconference uh, talking about their experiences as different uh, by POC and women individuals involved in their roles with theater as actors, as artists, uh, and directing and screenwriting and many, many talents that we have listed here today um, that are featured. So they'll get more into that later. So right now uh, we have a one hour live stream and we're recording. Uh, it will be available with captions after this uh, streaming is completed, but we wanted to thank all of our sponsors, especially Cement Space for their technical support and right now we'll have, um, we will have a, a couple question and interview and then we'll have a short time for some Q and A afterwards. Um, and we'll go ahead and interview uh, all of our panelists and so people can watch and add captions if they want uh, questions and it will be relayed to us on the caption features in Facebook and uh, YouTube. So once we're finished, we've concluded then we will go ahead and share all of uh, all of the social media handles so that all of you can follow and we can all follow each other. So I am ready to welcome our panelists. I'm super excited. Welcome panelists. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. All right. So, okay. All right. So can we see, is everyone, is everyone, can we see everyone? Okay. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start. Um, let's go ahead and intro introduce yourselves, please. Uh, we're going to go ahead go ahead and ABC order. So Michelle, go ahead and introduce yourself first. Just a little bit about your background and your experience in the film industry uh, for about three minutes. Sure, absolutely. Hi, so my name is Michelle Banks. My name sign is this, and I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, my background regarding how I fell into theater. Um, when I was younger, there's a, there was a movie, Sounder, in 1970, and it was a, it's a classic movie. Um, it's about a black family. And the woman who was the lead character, the lead actress, it was Cis, Cicely Tinson. And it, it was very impactful for me. Um, I told my mom that I wanted to be just like her. I wanted to be exactly like her. So my mom, explained to me what the role of as, as an actor was and I never forgot it. I, after my mom described what performance and acting is for me, I decided that that's what I wanted to do and I wanted to do everything I could to be just like that actress. Um, and in growing up, I took acting classes. Um, I went to MSSD um, and I, I was in shows like West Side Story. Um, and then I graduated from high school and I continued on with my dream of uh, being an actor. And so I went to the State University of New York, purchased SUNY, um, pursued acting, graduated. And then it was 1990. And I started my own theater company, Onyx Theater in New York City, Onyx Theater Company. Um, and, and I noticed that I really needed, that we needed more opportunities for black deaf people. I mean, I see, I saw Deaf West, um, New York Deaf Theater, but I was like, where are the black people, performers? So this was right after college, I was 22. There were so many steps that I really needed to, to understand for myself, but I, I set up Onyx and worked it for 11 years, but, then I said, well, I need to be pursuing my dream as an actor. I've been giving to the community for a total of 11 years, but I need to be focusing on myself, my own personal growth. So then I decided to go to Los Angeles and get involved with Deaf West. Um, Big River was a show. There was a television show that I was in. Um, there were many things that I was involved in. And that's my background thus far. Is there anything else that I should be saying? <laughs> Um, other things. Um, oh yeah, Voca. 
So I went back to uh, my hometown of Washington, D.C., and I planned on going back to Los Angeles, but then for some reason, the universe called me to <laughs> stay here. And it's been 12 years being in Washington, D.C., time flies. Um, so then I, I set up VOCA, Visions of Creative Artists, um, or Visionaries of, of, of creative, creative Artists. That was last year. And so I directed a play at Gallaudet University. Uh, it's called A Raisin in the Sun. Uh, that was with the deaf cast. Um, and Ethan and I uh, discussed his vision, the director, uh, the other maybe associate director. Um, and this was again in DC. And we had two voice performers. One was Tiffany and then the other was Nate. And, um, and so we thought, why wouldn't we just set something up in the Washington DC area? And then we set up VOCA and it's been that way ever since. So it's a very exciting endeavor. It's an exciting time for all of us. Yes, well, we look forward to, uh, again, your website will be featured there. So you can definitely check that out later. Um, so again, Milani, hello. Yes, hi. So I just wanted to make sure that, let me review the question really quick. I wanted to make sure I answer it. Yes, just a bit about your background and how you got in the industry. Right on. So I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I mean, I have been so deeply, I mean, I feel like a captain in the theater arts, you know, um, in New York. I've had so much exposure growing up in New York. And um, I've always been fascinated with theater. And the first thing that I was fascinated with was television. Um, a lot of my best friends didn't realize, but I grew up with a hearing family. I have two older brothers who are hearing and my parents are also hearing. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm deaf, you know, but I was so fascinated with television, with moving pictures and there were no closed captioning. There was no closed captioning at that time, but there were cartoons and like Looney Tunes, for example. And I was like, oh, what's that? There's so much expression. And so eventually, uh, Sesame Street came out with Linda Bove, and I was like, oh my gosh, sign language. And um, and then I went to the deaf school at PS 47. Uh, there was a public school in New York City, hearing and deaf students. And that was where my language acquisition really took off. Um, and so then I would be, you know, I, but I was still fascinated with television, but then I would see older children be signing together and with their facial expressions, I was so interested. And um, then during school, I would take different trips to theater because it was in New York City and it was always really fascinating. So uh, that's how I got into theater that way. Uh, and then around fifth and sixth grade, I started to really involve myself in actually being in theater. Um, and like my signing really took off during that time period. And I believe the theater arts are drastically improve children's academic uh, performance humongously. Um, uh, plays and theater really helped me. And throughout high school, I, from, I, it helped my development. So I definitely encourage um, the theater for all students. And again, I was the only, hearing person, the only deaf person in the hearing family. And then I had two younger sisters who are also deaf, but you know, everyone in my family signs and we can all communicate with one another. But when my family is talking, I, there, I, or th I miss out on certain things, but in the deaf school, I caught everything. So everything that was put on in the deaf school was uh, theatrically, I, I fell in love with. Um, and then I went to Gallaudet University when I got a little older and I missed that. And one of my best friends who was involved in theater told me uh, that there, there was a specific job. Um, oh, from 92 to 96. Um, I saw a lot of deaf theater um, during my time in Gallaudet, um, but there wasn't a lot of dance. Oh, physical physical therapy is what I was working on. Um, and I, I, there were other subjects that I wanted to take like chemistry and, uh, and things like that um, and, and general education. But then I thought I would, I would love to work with in the theater. Um, and and also carpentry. <laughs> um, and so then, I when I came back from Gallaudet to New York City, I started working a lot more. And theater has always been in my heart, you know, movies and watching film. And I've worked for so many different 
so many different worlds uh, in the theater. And there's international uh, entertainment also that I've been involved in. Um, and I'm just such a visual artist myself. And so I know that it's very important to spot like deaf talent. And I know that deaf people will be very successful in the coming years regarding entertainment. Um, and in 2012 or 2010 and on that generation of, of people who have been involved in theater, there's a lot of new ideas coming after, the, after 2010. Um, but before that, the attitude was very different and I've actually watched the attitude change since then. But I, under, I know that deaf, uh, participation in film and theater will certainly develop. Um, and there's so much uh, TV and movies. I've worked with Jade Bryan, deaf filmmaker, um, since 2010 myself. So, um, and I know that there's also a web series that I've created um, with, with, a, with my uh, co-creator, Craig Fogel. He's a hearing interpreter and, um, I mean, we were both struggling to get into the industry and we decided to make something of our own. And so um, I was lucky to be able to have the knowledge, like I said, of growing up in the field and business and, and the politics of, of the, the industry and um, being bilingual, bicultural and having hearing and deaf people in the world. But what I work on is to bring deaf people into the entertainment industry to further promote the deaf community. Um, I, Craig and I are holding our writing for season two for Don't Shoot the Messenger, which is what our web series is called. But um, we are very, I'm very involved in television and film. And so I, I know that the deaf community will certainly uh, continue to prosper. And I think it has to do with our attitudes collectively, hearing people and deaf people, deaf people becoming more open to hearing people and he hearing people understanding sign language more and learning. And I, we're kind of looking at each other more like humans rather than a deaf person and a hearing person. So that's my educational focus. Wow, that's so beautiful, Melanie. Thank you so much. That was an amazing introduction. Uh, and again, just your level of experience. And then last but not least, Dickie Hearts. Hello everyone, yes, hi, so I'm Dickie Hartz, and uh, this is my sign name, the heart handshape on the chest. So thank you so much for having me here today and being involved on this panel. I'm really thrilled and feel very honored. Thank you so much. Um, I identify as a Hispanic and mm. uh, a queer, as a queer identity and by POC person, and he, him are my pronouns. And I'm a director and actor. And just recently, uh, it was only a few years ago, I started uh, becoming a, a writer. Um, so another another title to add to my many roles. Um, but where should I start? Uh, I guess I'll start. So I was born here in New York City. Oh, uh, yes. And I'm here currently in New York City also. Uh, that's where I'm streaming from. Um, but I was born in New York. And I did not grow up here, though. I grew up in Virginia. And then... Uh, I went to Gallaudet, graduated in 2011, and um, had a wonderful time there. Uh, I went to LA for seven years, wanted to see what it was like there, you know, being in the city. But I didn't grow up in New York, so I wanted that exposure to the city, and it felt like I came full circle being able to take advantage of that experience and, and then going back to New York. And so my experience in, in training to become an actor um, I think it was about two years ago, or well, I was two years old, I was really little, and I just remembered, I was just so enthralled with something that I saw on TV, and I would start to embody different characters that I saw on TV, and for a long time when I would go out, and uh, again, because I was deaf, there were not a whole lot of other kids that I could communicate with, um, so I would tell them, okay, so you get to pick a role, and I get to pick a role, and then we would all, like, kind of take on different roles, and I don't know what to call that game, but um, that's what we did, and that was how I was able to interact and, and sort of experience that, and and again, later it was that I discovered that's what you would call theater. And so I became immersed in that. And when I was going to Gallaudet, um, I, I got into film. I took a film class and I decided to put the stage acting on hold and went into film. And then when I graduated, I decided I wanted to become more immersed in TV and film and in, in that industry as an actor. Um, so I packed up my car and I took off and I drove from Virginia to LA and all by myself. I made the, the trek over and it was really fun and I really enjoyed it. I had no job. I just decided to take that leap of faith and go for it. 
Um, and so it was seven years that I was in LA, um, training, uh, professional acting workshops, um, coaching, um, and I did work with an interpreter the, during that time. And there were seven class, um, the USB, um, it's a very popular uh, theater class, uh, the uprights, the at USB is where I went. Um, and so that was one of the top improv schools. I went to one of the top improv schools in LA. So there's three, there's the groundlings, and then there's, um, the USCB that writes Citizens Brigades, and then there's a city, um, another city company that once based in Chicago, but the Upright Citizens Brigade, that's the one that I went with. And they had an interpreter and I learned a lot from them. And then trying to apply that to my deaf experience, um, it, it was interesting. And so I got into a few things with TV and film with that exposure and that experience, but it felt like I, was, I wasn't really getting in into the front stage. It was sort of, um, it was very competitive. The, the film industry is very competitive and getting directing and all of that, it was really hard to, to make a breakthrough. Um, and I started to become creative, start to express myself more creatively. So I started more writing, more acting. And I just kept getting immersed into that and trying to find that audience as well and that connection. And then I decided um, I wanted a new chapter. So when I went to the uh, UCB, um, it was kind of the right place, right time sort of experience because when I was involved in New York, um, the first TV show that I was involved in, it was um, on Netflix, uh, Netflix, uh, Tales of the Cities. Uh, that was my first breakthrough, my first um, major role. And that had reoccurring role as well. So there were five episodes and I had lines and I had scripts and there was a lot of practice rehearsing the scripts and the signs. And for me, that was just a powerful experience. It really helped, um, I really felt that I could show my queer and deaf and bi POC identities. And again, for that um, series that Netflix had, we had it again. So I was able to get another TV show. Um, and that was on HBO, the, um, that one uh, for HBO High Maintenance was a really incredible experience. It was before COVID, <laughs> before that hit in March. Um, so I know that that hit and, and throws all over. But um, when I got involved with that, it was, again, here in New York, seeing there was more opportunities here in New York compared to LA. And yes, there are some experiences there and some opportunities. And I, I love LA. It, it taught me so much. It taught me everything that I needed to know as an actor and gave me such an incredible tool set um, and especially for the film industry. And I learned so much about how to navigate that. So I'll always value and cherish that. But, um, but that's been my experience. And so that started in 2011. Uh, so it's been nine years. It's been about nine years. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you, Diggy Hearts, for that. And again, just talking about that experience and what you've learned and, and again, what it requires to get through, um, you know, with personality and, and so many different things that, that are required for our journey, but you yourself have the confidence in your identity and uh, the network too, as well, to be able um, to find those, whatever those different opportunities came up. So that's great. Okay. Um, so I know Diggy, you talked about, um, you know, again, what happened with coronaviruses. So I'm, ex I'm curious about your experiences, the before and after representation. If you noted any differences with by POC and deaf uh, entertainment uh, actors, um, do you have any, would anybody like to talk about that? Malini, would you like to? Uh, of course, yeah. So before COVID-19, um, I believe that everything before that, uh, there were a lot of Hollywood level, like higher level writers starting to develop concepts for deaf characters. That was starting to be added into the, into the mainstream. But then after COVID-19, everything went on hold, you know, things were suspended. Um, and so we're kind of all trying to take a pulse and we still can't predict what is going to happen. Um, do we know when it's going to, when COVID-19 is going to be done? Uh, or are we going to have a new normal? Are we going to keep going with casting deaf roles and having auditions? Right now, we have no real idea. We're kind of frozen. So um, being on hold is rough. But um, I know that there are some deaf groups who have decided to move to Broadway as all translation things via Zoom during COVID-19. And um, a lot of people were bored. Right. Yeah, and decided to start translating plays online. 
Um, and so far that's been a good experience for people. But, and I know that Monique Holtz um, last play, uh, Please Untranslate Me. Uh, that's what I was involved in with, with Dickie. And that was really something. Um, I mean, it was supposed to be live theater, but then we had to translate everything to Zoom and transition. And so it was a challenge for all of us. It took a lot of patience, the technology and Zoom itself. Um, but, you know, diving into the, into the experience and showing how people can do something like this on Zoom was interesting. And then here we are in the Zoom time period. So we have to figure out how to keep up our talent and keep up, um, you know, keep our representation going. <laughs> But there are so many deaf people who are writing and creating. And um, again, we're kind of on hold. It's kind yes. of a determined situation. I, I know that we want more deaf producers and directors, and but all of us are kind of having at the mercy of Zoom right now. So that's where we stand. Dickie, would you like to weigh in on that? Yes, well, again, just that that comment. I mean, so far, it seems like there's been so much work in it. And again, it's it's been so early that we've started working with Zoom and that's been such an interesting experience too. So working through um, just trying to use different minds, we have to change our mindset. We have to really use our mindset and focus and listen. And I, I feel like the energy, oh, sorry. <laughs> I feel like the energy is different as well. So I feel like more expressive. I've been feeling more of a desire to have that expression. Whereas before you can have that sort of back and forth, you have sort of this equal space of interaction, but with video and with this sort of Zoom, I feel sort of trapped. So there's this desire to get more out. So it's been such an interesting experience. And still it's been a good experience to take in within myself as an actor and to really understand and figure out what I'm gonna to apply to, to the future. I mean, something like that. Okay, so Michelle speaking. I noticed that before COVID-19, people, you know, there was there was some BIPOC work by POC, people getting work. Um, and now during COVID-19, we're getting even more work through Zoom. And I was like, what? This is so interesting. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, there ha I ha you know, there's, I've been teaching ASL and directing here and there, but after COVID-19, I mean, we are sitting here trying to figure out what to do with our time. And a lot of people have stopped working. Some people have been laid off from work. Some people are working from home. Yes, so it's like yes. we're sitting here with our hands in the sand and we're just kind of like, well, make the best of our time, you know, and we've got to be more inventive, more creative, do more things involving theater, write more. You've got time, produce more, direct. Um, so it's very interesting. Yes. And people have asked me to be involved in like stage readings of projects and before they weren't, there were, you know, and so VOCA, our, our, our group right now, um, has been having panels and discussions regarding BIPOC people, deaf artists, Black Lives Matter, you know, how do we feel about Black Lives Matter, um, the movement that's happening now and how do we share our stories ourselves and how people can actually hear our voices, you know, and share our stories. So it has been a very interesting experience. Um, I know that VOCA is creating a film. Um, I showed it on the panel, I believe today, but I'm sorry, it was on Thursday. Uh, it's called, We Were The, um, sorry, I'm not sure what that one was. So it's a short film. Um, and it was really inspiring. It's about 25, it's about 25 um, artists, performing artists and their signing experiences from like uh, speaking to dancing to movement. Um, it's an incredibly creative team. Fred Beam, um, Nate Patton, uh, Antoine Hunter, uh, among many others coming forward to present and saying we were the um, and you know, it's, it's like how people are living their lives through Zoom too. It's very fascinating. So we know that it's really important to make films and document what we do. And, um, you know, there's all of these different I ideas that we have together collectively and seeing all of these people talk together, it's fascinating because it makes me think about what I need to be doing. And, you know, again, creating films and writing. And as a POC person of color, um, 
sometimes I don't know where to start. I don't know exactly who to talk to or, you know, where to go to make it happen. I know that a lot of us have that feeling also as POC. So after COVID-19, I really had to analyze what my skills are and what it is that I can do. And, and the fact that I can do more than I thought, more than I did before. I can write a lot more and I should make the time to write more because before I said, oh, I don't have the time. And I, but now I do have the time. <laughs> so that's, um, I, that's certainly a difference between uh, before COVID time and, and after COVID. And it's not over. We're in the middle of it. We're in the thick of it. So after COVID-19, um, who knows what would become of our industry, what will become. And that show that we were in was called We Wear the Mask. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, and I know M Melania was saying that like we are we're in the middle of a change, you know? There's more opportunities for deaf people, more opportunities for BIPOC people. I can see the change happening and we are right in the middle of it and it's humongous and it's very exciting. Yes. Yes, very true. Very true indeed, Melania says. Definitely, and I wanna follow up with that um, and Dickie Hearts, I know you have a comment, but with the new, um, with everything that's going on for deaf and deaf blind, um, and hard of hearing people, the story, you were talking about expression with film and different things with that, um, short stories or poetry or acting. Um, but with yourself as an actist, what is it that you want? We're, Cause we're all on the same boat. We're all trying to figure out what to do. And again, there's different networkings that we have, different skill sets. Um, for example, I think some of you were involved with Deaf Night Live. And yes, yes, I know, Michelle, you were yes. And, um, and untranslated. Um, so I know there was that play, um, We Wear the Mask. Uh, so there's all these different things in Dickie Hearts. So you were involved with that as well. Yes, and I could follow up with that. Um, again, with Zoom ongoing, um, I think that what's missing from Zoom is again, just that in-person energetic connection, that being gone. But instead we can look at it as that we've become more connected. We are now able to have more access to people. There's more uh, connection with deaf people, with bi POC people, queer people, feminist. Um, there's more of the, that's a positive exchange that's happened that I feel that I really appreciate a lot since COVID-19 and using Zoom uh, because I do feel more connected. I don't feel so isolated anymore. So that has been something that has been nice that I really do appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle here saying that, you know, it's funny because we're working remote. Oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead, go ahead, Michelle. It's mine short, sorry, thanks. Um, working remotely, um, you know, you've got different performers from all over the country. It's no longer just where you live. Um, so that's a really special difference. Um, and it is a different mindset working with actors who are so far apart and now you're all together on technology. Yes, yes. And now Malini, go ahead. Yes. Um, and just to piggyback on that comment about Zoom, um, like according to now, all the TV shows and news talk shows and things like that, for example, every Good Morning America, um, the Today Show, uh, e Entertainment, all of those, they are using Zoom now. That's how they're broadcasting on television. And I see that COVID-19 has created this, like Ellen, for example, she's like live streaming from her house at Zoom, um, you know, talking in her broadcast from her home. So that we had to all transition immediately. And that was really interesting. It's the same as, uh, you know, deaf talent, BIPOC people are using Zoom during coronavirus. And I mean, before Zoom was pretty great technology, but for a company to be able to uh, proliferate as they have and meet everyone's needs, depending on, and based on, you know, <laughs> what we see on television and, and, and what we need, it's amazing that the change could happen so fast. Um, and, I, and I think that technology is the key. Without technology, we would be out of luck, up, up the creek without a paddle. So it's amazing what um, innovation can create. 
Yes, we can definitely see how Zoom benefits all of us. Again, we have the time to network. Now we have the time to become more uh, able to share ideas. We don't have to fly to meet each other in person. Um, we're, our, our limits are now more flexible because of that. Uh, and I mean, now we have more of an international, and I do know we have to respect time zones, but we can have more opportunities to brainstorm. And I really think that it is going to be a very positive outlook for deaf entertainment and the creative opportunities that are coming up. And again, just with Zoom, being able to see the three of you here, you know, having you here and just, uh, again, feeling that connection with you guys. And um, again, with you and, and other people involved with um, sharing creative ideas and sharing that deaf experience, how do you think we can be creative and how we can use Zoom in a creative way? So that means like, again, having the availability to on a global scale, you know, watch something. Now, again, our, our, a lot of the barriers that were there are no longer there. A lot of the limitations are no longer there. And I think for us, um, and again, it's been a long time that we've, this has been our passion. This has been something that we've um, really been involved in and as a collective, and I think it's overdue for sure that we have the visibility and we have um, the hot topic of Black Lives Matter. Um, and with what you've seen, what have you been inspired by? I'm curious about how you, you've been, you know, writing your stories and what other creative ideas have come up from your experiences that you've, that you've been impacted by since everything happening. Sure, Michelle here. So with Black Lives Matter um, and We Wear the Mask, it was, I mean, it was a great uh, amount of impact. That, that both of them had together. Um, regarding my own creativity and my skills to tell stories, I've been able to use those um, because I've been fed up. I've been frustrated and completely fed up to, to be heard, to be noticed. I would have wanted people to pay attention um, to my story and to our stories. I mean, we're humans, we're living here on this earth. So we, we wear the mask. Um, there was there's a hearing poet um, who wrote some of these works in the early 1900s. But when we read them, we were like, what? This is the same exact kind of information that is applicable to Black Lives Matter and during coronavirus. It's the same stuff, even though it was written in 1900. There's pain, there's struggle, there's suffering, um, there's oppression, discrimination, systematic racism. Um, when you wear the mask, you hide that pain. And I mean, you can't keep wearing a mask like that. You've got to take it off and say, here I am. And you have to fight for what is right. So regarding Black Lives Matter, I was very inspired to do this short film of, uh, of what we call mask right now. We wear the mask, but mask. Um, because there are new Black Deaf faces that we're bringing to the forefront. Some people we've never even seen before. Um, we, and we all, and Fred Beam brought us to all together, Antoine, all of these people. Um, and that is, it's been so helpful in representing um, our community and, and the participation of our community because we are out there, people are out there, but you know, sometimes people are, are overlooked. And, uh, and, and our community gets to come and show themselves and the truth comes out of us, especially during this time period. So it's, it's really amazing stuff right now. And right now, it actually makes me think, I mean, I have so many stories. I have films that I've written, that I wrote in 2004 that are just waiting. They're just left suspended in time and I need to, finish them. But the problem is I start my work and I don't finish it. I table it and I, I get distracted or I, I get on to the next venture and I need to really focus and, and pick something and finish it and then move it off the desk because it's done. And it's really valuable to have a, other perspectives too on, on creativity um, because I can see what I've done in the past and I say, okay, well, <laughs> I started something in 2004 and I need to finish it. Um, but also I'm doing my TV pilot and there's, there's just a lot to be done. It's one day at a time, one step at a time.
You can do it. You can definitely, can definitely figure out how to do that. Um, Diggy, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Yes, I think for me, for Black Lives Matter, and then with the coronavirus, you know that there's um, there's a strong need, uh, a strong desire for deaf and by POC representation and that diversity. There's been that need, there's been that desire for that equality. And it's interesting because when we look at the perspective of the hearing world and we see how it's been progressing with TV and film and stage theater and all of that, it's really related with racism and, and racial diversity in those areas too. And I feel with a deaf community, again, this is just my opinion, we're a little bit behind. So I feel that um, there is a strong need for that representation already, yes, but then with the coronavirus hitting and BLM coming up and Black Lives Matter and now we're screaming that, you know, we need to be here. And it's funny because I feel like we've been screaming that for a while now. We've been saying we need that. And yet we're still, we're happy now that people see that more than before. And it's better than never at all. But I, yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, that's how I feel. Milani, would you like to share? Yes. So it's interesting to see all of these monumental changes. Like before coronavirus happened, I mean, we also have Black Lives Matter, right? Which is all about revolution and peace. And I believe that uh, I, I support the movement completely, um, 100%. But I've also noticed that the Black Lives Matter movement is creating a lot more opportunities in general um, for BIPOC people in particular, um, which is great. I mean, more opportunities is great. But then there's also like the entertainment industry in New York City in comparison to Los Angeles, for example. In New York City, there's a lot more diversity. There's a lot different, more different kinds of people who come in to t film and television. And we see all the diversity that exists in New York City. And I saw that before coronavirus and before Black Lives Matter. Compared to Los Angeles, it's still very, very white, 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 white. Um, and the BIPOC representation is like one uh, to a group of white people. And so I would go, I would show up to auditions um, and I would be the only uh, BIPOC deaf woman and everyone else would be white. And this is Los Angeles, that's the culture of LA. But New York City is certainly different. Um, it is very diverse and uh, there's a lot of different auditions that, that are put out there regarding diversity and so I think it's interesting to look at both of those sides. Same thing with Netflix and uh, the other film streaming industries. Um, we can see that there's like white casts. Oh, and Amazon also. Um, they're emphasizing diversity now. And, you know, casting characters and doctors is like different genders and different races. And so we are seeing that. And now Los Angeles is like, uh-oh, we haven't been doing that. And now, and, and Hollywood itself is really uh, a, a bit embarrassed. Um, and so it's great to see more big organizations representing the diversity and the roles that need to be represented. And for example, HBO, like the headquarters are in New York City and the television's so insecure. I mean, it's, a, it's led by a black woman and the story is based in Los Angeles, but everyone are black actors. Um, and, and it's because, you know, they are focused on diversity. And it's not just an outward thing. It's, it's they want to know the inside stories uh, compared to LA and the network, it's just different. Um, the networks themselves in, in New York City are focused on diversity. And so Los Angeles has to understand that, oh, wow, I mean, I talk a big game, but I'm not doing the work. I'm, you know, I'm, it's lip service is what it's called. Um, and so New York City is often looking for authenticity and Los Angeles is a lot more superficial and has kind of face value work. So we can see that it's time to change and the big organizations are showing that and LA is learning and New York already knows. That's great. And, um, Michelle Banks says, there's one thing, uh, like the black interpreted theater community, there are some famous voices and we need stories. We need their stories. We don't want people to be silent. Um, Alexandria Wales 
is one. Wawa, Warren Snipe. Um, these are people who are black and deaf, BIPOC people, and they have stories and their voices are being heard. And that means Hollywood needs to do something to change how they work. Yes, you know, yes. very strong white culture, very white represented on, on the big silver screen. Um, obviously we need more diversity, but Hollywood really needs to catch up. They are, they should be embarrassed and they were getting even more embarrassed. Um, and here we are with Black Lives Matter and coronavirus. So it's like, it's Melanie, you are right on point. And then Dickie, would you like to say something to say, yes, I wanna add um, earlier, it was like, again, I was in LA for seven years and I tried different opportunities and I felt really frustrated and struggled. And then um, it moved to New York City and then in two years I had two TV shows and it was just such an amazing experience. And I was so grateful for the time to be in the right time in the right place. But I have to agree that New York City definitely has more acceptance and more awareness of diversity than LA for sure. And I think I'm hoping that, well, because so with, being BIPOC and deaf and that identity, um, we need more Asian stories. We need more indigenous stories. There's a long list of other deaf plus stories that we need. And I hope to see more of that um, with that. Michelle, did you want to say something? Um, not only NYC, but like even in Atlanta. Too. Yes, yes, wow, yes. Growing in Atlanta. And there's a lot of stories, diverse stories, BIPOC stories that are coming out of Atlanta. Um, so it's not just New York City and LA because we can't forget about Atlanta. Great, thank you so much. And then again, it's important to see who has the power and who's making the decisions and being aware of that, of those different levels. And, and we as a community also have power. And we can send letters and write, and we need to be active um, again and, and enforcing our needs and letting them know what we need. And again, that we have representation as a community. So we have to, again, we, we, have, we can't just watch, we have to protest, yes. And, and maybe our TV shows are protest in a way. Michelle, what do you think? Michelle says, that's what I did. I mean, like with soul food, for example, um, when I was living in LA back in 2001 or 2002, I, I saw Soul Food, the movie. And oh, I'm sorry, it was a series um, of Soul Food on Showtime. And I said, there should definitely be a black deaf writer. And I wrote to them to become a producer and I found the name and the phone number and I sent what I needed to say. We had some back and forth conversation and it took about a year um, close to a year. And finally they said, you know what, Michelle, let just come on down and we're going to start working with you. And I mean, I had to start somewhere. I have to start somewhere, you know? So I wrote, I communicated and I set up a relationship with the producers and they were willing to open their minds. And uh, that's what I did. Yes. I, yes. Melina says, yes, absolutely. I completely agree with Michelle. I mean, the network that we need to, uh, that we need to grab. We need to grab our interpreters. We need to find the things that we need as deaf people individually, BIPOC people. And remember, there's also the, uh, uh, a hearing mind and a hearing perspective. And you can have a deaf mind and a deaf perspective. But if both perspectives are opened and, and ready to educate and be educated, then, then opportunities abound, you know? And so, like, with Don't Shoot the Messenger, the, there were it's it's for a mainstream audience and they think it's funny but i'm i'm not here as a deaf woman to preach to you all um i mean it is comedy and it's funny and there's teasing situations but then there's also things that really happen in the real world issues that we speak about and people are like oh i didn't ever realize that happened and you know we put all of that out there and open people's minds so you know, when it comes to LA and New York and Atlanta, there's, <laughs> we know that Hollywood is hugely powerful. Um, and now we can see what happens, what's happening in the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're about to elect our new president. And when coronavirus will dissolve, right. or if it will, and you know, what the new stories that are, that are going to be, um, put out there. And we're also looking at these different networks and the executives and so many of a percentage, like the large percentage of them are white. And so we, I understand that we are 
uh, BIPOC people are, are, are getting a bit of an advantage, but we also need to be in at the executive level, also more women at the executive level. Um, what happens you know, when it comes to executives and how the turnover is going to be coming, I'm really interested to see what happens with the number of women, the number of BIPOC, you know, and the number of white women um, that start to replace some of these executives. That's what I predict. Um, I, I mean, the number of white male directors, they're actually uh, lessening and we're getting more BIPOC individuals. And so the shift is happening. Um, and it's very, very interesting. Um, uh, you know, there are different tech operations. There are uh, entertainment in the entertainment industry as well. There's a lot of shift. So I do uh, predict that there's going to be some, a lot of BIPOC, more BIPOC and women added, but who knows how long it's gonna take for that shift to happen. Um, we can't totally predict it, but uh, maybe who knows in 50 years, are we gonna be equal? I don't know. Um, and same thing, like we have to be, like Michelle said, we have to be aggressive in our networking and what, what we need, rep, our representation, the recognition of our work, we, it's very key. Um, and that will, that will open so many doors for all of us. Yes, yes. Oh, Dickie, did you wanna say something? Did you wanna add to that? Uh, yes, I think, you know, everything that Melanie is saying is it's exactly right. Uh, I think that's why I feel like that with the hearing world and hearing culture and mainstream, like again, that's progressing with BLM, they've been shocked, but they've been moving forward. But the deaf community uh, feels like it hasn't. It feels like it's been very behind. And I imagine that, you know, the, a lot of the white deaf leaders that we see, there's so many people that we see. And again, we see there's maybe three BIPOC people that I can think of that are deaf and then the rest of them are white. And so it's this long list that we have again. And I just, I just feel like we're behind. It's very true. So you feel, and again, with our community and with mentorship and leadership, we need more of that and reminders and we need really to invest into our BIPOC community um, for those creative endeavors and for that creative growth. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we only have 15 minutes left. This is such an amazing discussion. I wanna keep going and I just really appreciate listening to all of you. Um, but I do have one question um, for Michelle. Let me go ahead and uh, click this. But um, Michelle, you had the opportunity to um, uh, view compensation. Oh, there was someone that's saying hello. Um, and with Michelle, did you get an award from Black Deaf Theater Film Festival? Oh, it's from one of our users, the question. I don't know if you got any of that, Michelle, but can, can you answer? Um, oh, so um, there's a person named Richard. Okay, I, I know who Richard is. Yes, yes, because I've been watching um, one of your great accomplishments that you wanted to share about. Um, well, yeah, it's definitely a, a great, I mean, I have a, a few really great accomplishments that I would say. Um, well, I did establish Onyx and I did that because I need to, I wanted to give back to the community. I wanted to feel, it feels good to know that I am doing something for the community. Um, I mean, I'm, I've been screaming for help, screaming for roles for so long, not knowing where to go to train or for work opportunities in, in theater. So I've want, I wanted to establish something. And um, that was, I think my first really uh, huge successful accomplishment, accomplishments of my own opinion. Um, and Richard is my, uh, my, Part, my ex-partner, my, part, my former partner. Um, and there was a play that we did in DC. We started that in 2012 and in sight and sound, uh, it was deaf poetry. Um, and so we brought deaf poets, dancers, musicians, ASL performers, and just so many different, um, there's so much diversity, queer, gay, straight, BIPOC, trans, you name it. Um, and we need to see more of that. Um, and that was our accomplishment, Richard and I. Um, and again, that was in DC at the Black Theater Festival. Um, 
So, and all, VOCA is another one, a, another accomplishment for me, something that I founded and established um, and it's still going. So those are a couple of my honorable mentions. And then one of my, my other accomplishment is uh, make, making my breakthrough in television, you know, with Soul Food, it was finally. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. I know it's hard to pick one accomplishment. I know it's hard out of, you know, everything that we've done, but Dickie, um, Nalani, is there anything that you wanted to share? Um, can you remind me of the question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> one, one, of a, one of your top accomplishments that you've experienced or achieved, if you wanted to share that. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, I'll choose two big accomplishments so far. Um, I mean, as I look back, I, I was an executive producer and actor for Don't Shoot the Messenger. And that was really key in my, uh, you know, my own development and success. But then I was on Netflix, Master of None with Aziz Ansari um, and Alan, I am forgetting his last name right now, but it's Alan Letty, I believe, Wang. I'm sorry, Alan Wang. He's uh, the creative director who brought me on. Um, for the creative development for the cast and crew and uh, for the fourth season. And um, we developed a trusting re a relationship of trust. And then, you know, we did a lot of work workshopping together and we selected a cast. And um, I felt really, I, I didn't, I felt some kind of way about certain things throughout the process. I felt like something was wrong working with them. I mean, I'd been an executive producer before and they wanted me to help provide an authentic deaf experience so I did my best but I, I was feeling some kind of way and I had to say something about it and I said you know what I asked or I made a recommendation I encouraged all of the crew to listen to the dazzle to the director of ASL based on the feedback regarding deaf culture and linguistics and everything and the crew listened um and I said don't you know don't listen to the director, listen to the dazzle, the director of ASL, um, because they're the person, ah, and also don't listen to the interpreter, <laughs> listen to the dazzle. Um, and, I, and I noticed that they, there was a, a, a sense of transparency and trust that began to develop. And people, the cast and crew began to really listen to the, to the deaf director of ASL. And that's when our voice, the deaf voice, really started to come through. And it was a success. A success. Um, and uh, regarding HBO and high maintenance, we had uh, some really great uh, participation. And I was the, the dazzle for that. And I, and I brought up those same points. I said, you, we need to get interpreters for each of these roles, uh, each of the deaf people who are in the show. And they listened. Um, and because, and, and I, that means that I know that they had seen my work and heard about the kinds of things that I do and how I am focused on authenticity. And I will say something if I do not believe that it is happening the right way. And I will take the time to just to describe what I need to say because we are representing the deaf community and I will not be ignored, you know, and, and it's really interesting the amount of time that it's taken for this to happen and who knows about how Hollywood looks at it, but New York and Atlanta have changed their attitudes to really advocate for deaf people and directors of ASL, and they need to be listening to our opinion. And if they continue to do that, we will all succeed together. Um, and I, and, you know, I'm still looking at LA. I don't, there's still work to do, but there's a lot of big accomplishments. And, um, and we need to make sure that we have collaboration within one another. Um, and empower uh, each other. I mean, the deaf people need to empower the hearing people to understand that they need to listen to deaf people. And then the hearing people need to empower deaf people to understand that they have a voice. Um, and if we can all work together and collaborate and hearing and deaf people can equally become very successful and make creative works together. Beautiful. That is a beautiful comment. Again, just that importance of trust and networking and having that equality and having that access for, for moving forward and whatever the creative endeavors that are there. Um, so Michelle, did you want to add anything? <laughs> There's one thing that I have to mention. It's so important. Um, it's my, my very first independent film. Yes. 
directed by Zabu Inre Davis. And I have to give a shout out to her and her husband um, who wrote that film. Uh, there are two leads, two deaf characters, um, two leading roles. And it was night, oh, it's a, it's a, it's called Compensation. And uh, it's a really unique film. It takes place in uh, present day and 1900 simultaneously. And there was, a, it was a story represented, representing a black deaf person. And it was shown at the Sundance Film Festival back in 2000. Um, and it was the first film showing that representation of a black Wow, woman. yes, yes. Um, and we received several, uh, you know, honorary mentions and some awards and um, were known throughout the world. Um, and in Toronto, Canada, it was shown at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, same thing with uh, for another film festival um, in Africa. Um, and it, sh it was shown all over. So I was really honored to be able to have that accomplishment and, and to be a history making person of showing that representation for the first time. Wow, I'm, I'm talking with the team a little bit. Again, I, I don't wanna interrupt, but um, I know we have our, our time limit, but I wanted to let you know that compensation, that film will be available today for free uh, to the public. Uh, you can check our Facebook website for the link. Um, and uh, again, for any questions or um, comments, you know, please, please post there. Diggy, did you want to add anything or, or have any more comments? Again, just about your top accolades, top accomplishments. Yeah, so top accomplishments, like my, my success. Um, I'd have to say, <laughs> um, I think that definitely um, getting that with Netflix for two cities. Again, that was my first big TV role and having that major role, um, getting that work, Tales of the City and working with Laura Linney and learning from her, learning just all of that she had to offer. And then also, again, with the HBO High Maintenance, um, working with Martha Stewart, um, working with um, Milani and just, it was such a humbling experience for me. Just, uh, again, it definitely um, gave a, a recognition of accomplishment for myself as a deaf actor. Just having that experience, having that uniqueness as a queer bi POC person, again, just having that availability to make that work. And again, especially because I have so much intersectionality with my with my identities as a deaf by POC queer person. And so just that definitely was the biggest accomplishment that I have. Um, feeling like a self-made writer, my creative endeavors, my directing abilities, just all of that. It won three national film competitions and just in 2015, 2016, 2017 consecutively. And so with 15, I forget which one we won. Um, it was a mentorship. It was a mentorship with director Petro um, Frenny, who directed, um, there was a Green Book, the director of Green Book last year, um, and mentored with him, uh, Peter Fairley. And again, with HBO and that program, the project that we did that was greenlighted, uh, first place, 5,000. Uh, there was another one, 2017. Um, it was included with AT&T Creative. Um, Creative at, and with cre the creative fund, and again we won first place in that creative fund. We won, um, we got a cash prize for that, and again just those things, those accomplishments. Again, I had that recognition of being a self-made person. Again, with HBO and Netflix, it was such an honor to be part of this, to have that high representation as a deaf, deaf queer BIPOC person. It was, it was such an, an awesome experience for me. And again, you talk about that intersectionality and that experience as a person. And for myself as an Asian deaf woman, um, there's not a lot of representation out there for myself. And so I want that to be more encouraged, that to be more, again, uh, even with movies, you know, uh, of course, the movie that we're working on has to get approved and all of that. And again, just listening to your individual stories is encouraging about that. But, um, oh wait, hold on, there's a question coming through. Um, do you mind talking about your experience about 
your the the dialogue there about how that experience, what that looked like, um, Milani. Yeah. So I had previously mentioned the, about the transition to Zoom from a stage read. We're talking about the experience with Monique Holt um, and on Translate Me, and um, it was a really interesting to have to make that transition. And from my experience, <laughs> I felt like the energy, the vibe was really disrupted um, in Zoom and all the turn taking. And it was, uh, there, were, uh, there was a lot of patience that needed to happen. So um, the director and editor, there's Amelia Hensley uh, and she did a lot. She, she did a lot to give us really great creative direction. Um, and regarding <laughs> rehearsal and tech itself, yes. like a week and a half crammed, all that was crammed into a week and a half. So, and it was like Sunday and I was having to film and I had to send them, send my work to Amelia and make sure that it looked good. And I was like, whoa, this is a lot of work. So that experience, um, plus in addition to Monique's writing, Momo's writing, um, for all the whole audience to see and understand what it is to like, to be a deaf person and go through the things that we have to and feel a constant life of oppression and under autism. And um, it, it's, it was a beautiful experience. Um, and also working with Dickie too, there was, there was a lot that had to happen and it was a great accomplishment, but that play is still not completely done in, in its writing. Act one and act two have not been written yet, but act, uh, there's still so much feedback um, and there's so much room for improvement always. I mean, it's never done. So um, we're editing <laughs> um, and we will continue to work on that. But Moni Colt is the director and uh, the writer. And so sh we are all, she's working to make it even better than it has been. And Michelle said, Monique herself, Momo, is BIPOC. She's Asian also. So she's an amazing human. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And Dickie, you wanted to say something about that? Yes, thank you for mentioning that name. Um, it was such an honor for me to be involved with that project. And again, often for me with uh, creative writing um, by a deaf person, um, by POC woman, having that opportunity, we, we don't often have that. So having that experience as an Asian woman, deaf, it was such an amazing experience to be a part of that. And it was difficult because it was such a short time. We only had a week and a half. Um, so it was like one day of rehearsal and then we started filming. And again, it was, it was really amazing, but just, it made me recognize so many, again, with the Zoom, just so many things that we never had the, the comfort, again, we, we would have never had the time frame for that until now with the Zoom. So it was a new skill set that I had to pick up really quickly to try to make sure that we understood we had typically you have a month for rehearsals and for figuring out lines and, and understanding the metaphors and analyzing the script. And it was all condensed into a week. And so that on top with everything that's happening outside in the world right now with coronavirus and BLM and the police brutality and just all of those triggers that are happening to be in this process and have to condense everything it was definitely a new skill set that we all had to quickly learn and pick up. And, but it was still such a positive experience uh, on, you know, learn all of that on the fly and just be ready to apply that. So now we have that skill set that we're ready. You know, we have, we know that we have that, but again, being deaf and, and Asian and woman and those identities for Monique Holt, And I'm trying to remember, there was another name. Um, it's Jang, um, what is his name? Oh my gosh, I don't remember. I, it's like we'll, Jang. We'll, we'll post it later. We'll post the name later. But yeah, but um, Amelia Henze, um, a, a female, again, she was, she was really nice in our collaborative team and, and just Hensley and having that experience. Patty says, yes, thank you so much again. We hope to see you both on stage soon, again, with act one and act two, you know, in the future, whenever, again, we can have that, or maybe Zoom, I don't know, maybe we end up doing it on Zoom. Because, um, you know, with Zoom, you know, improving, hopefully we can have holograms next, you know, maybe that'll be the next step, 3D, we don't know, but it would be amazing to see that edit, you know, and see what it would look like if we had that. Uh, I think it's possible, I think it's possible. Um, again, but whatever, 
the community is going to be able to develop and as we are artists and we have that ability so thank you so much Malini for that and Dickie Hartz and uh, again you talked about Franklin and that experience does he have a name sign for that actor uh, GF oh Grace and Frankie that show yes uh, for Grace and Frankie, um, for being involved with that film, what was what was it like with your character? Well, I was really lucky. Um, I had an amazing experience working with a director and for a long time uh, and being able to direct that and working in LA for uh, in 2011. Again, it was just, uh, we just found each other and we worked, we still work together to this day. We still text, um, we're still exchanging and, um, I sent in my headshots to that project. I got picked. And then that role for me, uh, yeah, it was a deaf role that was that was I was auditioning for. And I remember that year, again, it was 2016. And at the same time, I was just getting involved with an HBO project that got greenlighted um, for a competition at the exact same time, in the middle of working all of that out and making those um, for the scouting and getting locations and getting the script ready and having the deaf crew there and a deaf DP and having all of the actors being involved and really working the whole production out. Then I got contact <laughs> for that show. And um, they said, oh, that you wanted to be involved. Um, and I had to get in again, I, I didn't have anything ready and it was such a beautiful experience and I was so grateful for the grace that they gave me when I got involved in that. And they said, oh, are you ready tomorrow? And I said, uh, and it wasn't exactly like the next day, but um, they told me that the deaf director, again, it had been greenlighted for that. And it was the same day. And I had just made a reservation, um, getting something for the crew um, and the actors again. Right. No, you remember, M Michelle, um, it was insane. It was insane. It was just everything that was happening at that time. And I was really trying to get all that worked out. And in the morning, um, Oh, I barely made it. Um, I had to, I obviously had to pick uh, the Netflix uh, with that wonderful opportunity and send in my resume to that and send in a reel. And working with Jane Fonda was just amazing. It was such an honor for me being involved in that project. Um, so again, I arrived on stage and I had the ASL interpreter and they showed up and um, I can't remember what we started with in the role, but I picked up the script and I remember reading it and just sort of smiling and, oh, and we started, um, yeah, I, I, they handed me the script that same day. So I, I, I got my script and I had the, the paper packet in my hand. It was a cold read. Um, and, uh, I showed up with that card, um, the, the, the peeler that they gave me. Um, that had the character and everything again just that brief introduction packet that I had and then they had cards for me um, with the script that I was reading and just that representation that I saw in 2016 I was like I don't know how I feel about this there hadn't been any deaf influential actors at, at that time yet there wasn't a whole lot going on there should have been but there wasn't. And so I said, okay. And there wasn't a DASL, there wasn't a um, deaf a ASL director. And so I tried to work with him and I had the interpreter with me. And so I was talking to the director and saying, you know, I'm reading this and I'm really excited to work here and have this experience. But I was wondering, could I offer a few suggestions? Because in this, what I'm reading in the script isn't exactly true to a deaf person experience of today. So I just wanted to share with you. And they said, yes, go ahead. So I used my phone and I went through and I we were able to communicate without the interpreter. And the director was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So he called over the, the script writer. And that day we made so many changes. Patty's saying, that's amazing. And Dickie's saying, yes, you, you know, I had to just go ahead. I I I had to make that change and it and it changed my paradigm forever. Just being able to think that I myself who can show up on stage and be involved with this, but yes, it's about representation. It's about authenticity. And I can't live an unauthentic life or an unauthentic role. And I had to try. And if they tell me, no, that's something that I have to accept. But I was so lucky in that experience because they were so willing to let me um, make that shift. 
and then having that dialogue with Jane Fonda and then started, we started filming. And I don't know if you'll remember, but um, in that, in that scene where we're going through the phone, there's like a little sad face emoji and we click that sad face and that was all improvised. That was not rehearsed. Um, and I decided that I wanted to just go ahead and, and improvise that. And Jane was kind of shocked while she was, you know, when we were doing that scene and she laughed and then afterwards we saw, we thought that it was really funny and that it worked. Um, but it got such a strong reaction. And so I don't know if they decided to keep it, but, uh, that they had options again, because I, as an actor was able to provide those authentic experiences. And then, so 2017, I was watching it and I thought, it was so touching that that happened. That emoji came up, but I saw that scene and I was just so impressed. It was such a nice feeling and a wonderful experience to see that happen. Thank you so much, Dickie, for sharing about that experience. Again, just what a creative op opportunity and for you to do that. And again, just representation of the deaf community and using technology and that. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing about that. Um, Mich I think we have another question, hold on. I'm wondering about, I know this weekend, again, the movie's being released for free. And what are you hoping for people to get from that movie, from watching that film, Michelle? Uh, that's a great question. So I'm just hoping that people absorb the story and think about how as a deaf person, man or woman, what have you, but a, a black deaf person and this story uh, happens throughout time from 1900 to now and how we can relate um, specifically to that story. Um, again, it's about a black deaf person. Um, I want people to, who are watching to leave with the idea that we can relate um, not about, it's not about status or stratification, um, or even, and yes, we are still struggling with racism even today. Um, and there's a lot of issues that, that still ring true that were in 1900 and, and now, but I want people to leave with understanding that with an ex acceptance of our culture and of ourselves and leave more open-minded. Um, and, and an acceptance of our language as well. Because I think that, that, that people tend to look at black deaf culture as, as uh, their language, their culture, their identity. But I want people to have more empathy and understanding and more willingness to understand. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. I hope all of you watch the movie and I know we have time to close. Oh, did you wanna add something real quick, Melanie? Yeah, I wanted to mention um, something that Dickie said. Um, it was about uh, the Asian, oh, that person, it's J Jiang, Wang, Jiang Wang. Um, so, I mean, it's, a, it's a Jenny Wang. Um, so, yes, a deaf actor who produced that. Yes, thank you for mentioning that name. Thank you for, for clarifying that. And again, it's important that as creative artists, we keep going and support the community and support each other, you know, financially and investing in um, in our endeavors and sharing our websites. And again, thinking about the opportunities and where we can have other people come in and, and take advantage of those opportunities. We need to make sure that we're giving people the space. Uh, we have the power, we have uh, as entertainers and again for for that representation we get to see on stage what happens and and you've had that experience with movies and as time goes on I, I hope we can make that shift and again thank you so much this was such an amazing panel I had uh I wish we had one more day where we can get together and just chat <laughs> and just talk it would be so amazing to have that one day um and so thank you again for showing your stories and uh just about representation and your experiences uh, with representation of, um, again, so many people in the audience are watching and and you all are so talented and amazing. So for them to see that is amazing and inspiring. And again, um, we look forward to seeing your work in the future ahead and seeing what comes up. And just many thanks to um, our deaf panelists and uh, 
DPAC for their support and the captions SFDD. Thank you. Thank you all of you for watching and to have been with us. And uh, again, the, uh, comp um, the movie that we have available is for free. Um, compensation is for free. So please watch Michael Eleni, uh, film director. Um, I'm sorry, wait, film direct? No. Film director, <laughs> the film festival, the film night festival and the sponsor. Um, we wanna thank them for joining. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Picard. <laughs> thank you. And I think we're done. I don't know if we're...